Hey, buddy. I can't hear you yet, but I'm going to start in just a minute. And then, uh, like I said, a few tunes and I'll bring you on. And it's going to be a big one tonight. I can feel it in my bones. I'll ask you if you, want, if you have any requests uh, after we, uh, when we get on, so think about it. Because <laughs> believe me, I'm running out of shit to play these days. <laughs> All right. Got everything. I'm live here. Okay. It's Thursday, and that means welcome to CNF's place. How are you, everybody? I imagine we have some people in the rooms. I already see my mom is on right away. The first one in. Mom, thank you very much. You can hear my vocal. Can you hear my piano? Let's see if we can get it all right the first time. Because God knows we've had plenty of weeks where that has not been the case. But I feel like that's what makes it feel so homey. Like we're together in the living room. And who cares if I screw up, right? At least that's what I like to believe. Who else we got on there? I see my mother's on YouTube. Who's on Facebook? Anybody on Facebook? Can you see me there? And once I know that, we can get started. Mike Brennan's on Facebook. How you doing, Mike? Good to talk to you. I'm going to talk to you tomorrow. I believe we have a conference call. What a day. This will be my first uh, guest who is not coming on here expressly to sing songs. This is uh, an exciting day for me. And I think for the entire music community, and probably for YouTube, because, I mean, let's be honest, Len Casper, that's a big star. That's a huge, that's a, that's a bright star in the sports firmament. And yes, he's here, which I'm not saying has the best judgment, but he's a great guy. So there you go. Hey, Peter, how are you? Hildy, I'm so sorry to hear about Lebo. He was a great guy. And I'll miss seeing uh, him at the shows, but I hope I will still see you there. All right, let's get started, shall we? I'm going to do a few, and uh, I want to warm up, so I'm going to try this one, which I have done once before, I think. Mm -mm. Matthew Francis Anderson. What's up, Matt? How are you, man? It has been a long time. get no rest I don't know how I work all day when will I learn memories get in the way I walk around I can't hear a sound folks talking loud but I don't see at all I gotta get away gotta get away I don't know where to go it's hopeless so Guess I'll leave it alone Spent all my day Fixing up to go somewhere Thought I was late Till I found she wasn't there I guess I'll find A love peace of mind some other time But I still have today I gotta get away, I gotta get away I don't know where to go It's hopeless so I guess I'll leave it alone King people play A night or day They're just not imagining What they should do It keeps me feeling blue Been down too long And that wrong they just can't stop it spending all day thinking just of you 45 heading for that subway home i took my time cause i felt so all alone not far away 
I heard a funny sound, took a look around, and I could see a face. I was smiling as she came, calling out my name, so I know where to go. We'll take it slow, I guess I'll call it a day. Games people play, night or day, they're just not matching what they should do. It keeps me feeling blue. Been down too long, right or wrong, they just can't stop it. Spending all day thinking just of you. But bye, but bye, Yeah, little spinners. I thought I'd start a little up tonight. Sometimes I get a little emotional at the top of these shows because I'm so happy to see you all. Johnny Gallivan, how are you, man? Good to see you. Look at this. Look at this. We've got a lot of friends in the house. So good. So what should be the next thing, I wonder? <laughs> oh, my goodness. I have so many choices. I think I'm going to do... <laughs> I think maybe, you know what? I think I'll do a little bit of, um, I think I'll do a little Bob Marley. Old pirates, yes, they rob I. So lie to the merchant ships Minutes after they took I From the bottomless pit But my hand was made strong By the hand of the Almighty We forward in this generation Triumphantly I want you help to sing these songs of freedom Cause all I ever have Redemption songs Redemption songs Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery None but ourselves can free our minds Have no fear for atomic energy Cause none of them can stop the time and how long shall we kill our prophets? Well, we stand aside and look. Uh, some say it's just a part of it. We've got to fulfill the book. Uh, won't you help to sing these songs of freedom? Is all I ever have. Redemption songs. Redemption songs, redemption songs. Emancipate yourselves from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. We oh, have no fear for atomic energy. Cause none of them can stop the time And how long shall they kill our prophets While we stand aside and look Yes, yeah, some say it's just a part of it We've got to fulfill the book I want you help to sing These songs of freedom Cause all I ever had Redemption songs And all I ever have Redemption songs These songs of freedom These songs of freedom Ah, I don't think I've done that since, uh when John Lewis passed away, I did that song, I think. What's the quote? Um, 
When you see something that is not right, you have to speak up. You have to say something. You have to do something. You must be bold, be brave, and courageous, and find a way to get in the way. And uh, I think that's been happening lately, it seems to me, which is, uh, you know, that's all right. We have to uh, be vigilant all the time. All right. I'm going to do one more song, I think. And then I'm going to bring out Mr. Len Casper. And we're going to talk. And I encourage you all to bring uh, comments and questions. And uh, we'll try and address them as they come in. Remember, there's about a minute delay. So don't be uh, upset if you're not immediately addressed. So anyway, hi, Tracy. Kenny, aren't you in, are you in Hawaii and watching from there? That's crazy. And I see Tom Kunkel. Tom Kunkel, I've had this hair for years. And you know that. So I think I'm going to, uh, oh, you know what, I am in, I, my reverb has been off this entire time. I just got it in where I can turn my reverb on and off from my little uh, stream deck here, and I forget to do it all the time. So I'll do that now when I uh, do this next song, because it requires a little bit more, I think. Let me see. And maybe a little on the voice, too. Ah, oh, that's nice. Soul, ah, uh, where are we? I'm in the wrong key. So deep, so wide. Will you take me on your back for a ride? If I should fall. Would you swallow me deep inside? River, show me how to float. I think that I'm sinking down. Thought that I could get along. But here in this water, my feet won't touch the ground I need something to turn myself around Going away Away towards the sea Can you lift up and carry me? Oh, roll on, roll on through the heartland Till the sun has left the sky River, river, carry me high To the washing of the water Make it all all right Let your waters reach me Like she reached me tonight I'm letting go It's so hard The way it's hurting now To get this love untied So tough to stay with this thing Cause if I follow through I face what I denied I'll get those hooks out of me I'll take out the hooks that are sunk deep in your side Kill that fear of emptiness And the loneliness The loneliness I hide River, river, river running deep Bring me something Will help me get to sleep Washing of the water will take you all away. Bring me something to take this pain away. Little Peter Gabriel, early in the night. 
And I think that may have showed a little bit. <laughs> but hey, what are you going to do? So once again, thank you for coming into CNF's place tonight. If you uh, are so inclined and you wish to send a tip, you can send them right there. And uh, it will uh, come to me and I will be so very grateful. However, never required. Always appreciated. We're glad just to have you here because uh, I got to tell you, this is a way for us to communicate, be together, share some music in a time of crisis, in a time of pandemic. I'm sure you're all aware of it. So... But what do you say? Maybe it's time that we bring on the great Len Casper. Do we have uh, do we have Cubs fans who are angry? Do we have Sox fans who are grateful? Do we have Chicago fans who are uh, okay with it either way? Let's find out, shall we? Hold on, let me find uh, my interview station. And uh, wait a minute, that's Len Casper. Hey, buddy. Hey, can you hear me, Chris? I can hear you just fine. How are you? I'm great. I have to tell you, uh, three great songs, but in particular, I really like, I don't want to get too deep right off the bat. I know we got to get all the, <laughs> Hey, how you doing? How's life? But I'm, I'm going to dive deep right off the bat here. Go for it. Uh, I saw Roger Daltrey about maybe eight or nine years ago uh, at house of blues. It was prior to uh, a who tour probably Quadrophenia. I'm not quite sure. Okay. But um, the Peter Gabriel tune you just did, like that was Roger that whole night. And what I loved about it was he wasn't quite sure where he was going and he kind of took us on that journey. And I think it speaks to not only your chops as a singer, but your confidence that, that you're going to get there and like to go to the, from the low to the high, like that's amazing to me. And I don't know if everybody out there, because you're so effortless, <laughs> understands just how impressive that is. So kudos, man. Well, thank you. And I got to tell you, when you say it, it sounds so official. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like well, I've been, to, there's a great story that uh, a friend of ours has told us a couple of times. He was on, I forget what gig it was. They were opening up for McCartney and uh, it's uh, Larry Beers and he's, uh, he's in the, uh, the food area before the, sh or after their, after their set, before, uh, McCartney goes on and McCartney walks into the area to get like a bottle of water or something. And he sees him, he says, uh, Hey, drummer, drummer, you're good. And when I tell you, you've been told. <laughs> oh that's great when i tell you you've been told oh that is awesome it's so, so can i have one more note note on daltrey absolutely so here's the here's the here are the kind of conversations that that we would have uh backstage at a, at a tributo show or uh, i'll have with just friends of ours and it's the it's the daltrey mick jagger question um what is this i guess i guess there's no wrong answer here but if you go back to late 60s, early 70s, you had two choices as a singer in those cases. You could do the Daltrey, won't get fooled again, scream. And he could literally never replicate probably ever again the rest of his life. And certainly not once he hit you know, 35, <laughs> right? Yeah. But he did, it, he did it for the song. Or do you do the Jagger thing, which is in 1967, you realize that in 2018, you're still going to be singing these songs and make sure that you sing it in a way that allows you to do it when you're 74. So which is the smarter play? I don't really know the answer. I, I may take issue with uh, the idea that Mick Jagger was that aware. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> no, I mean, I, you know, it's interesting, but th that was kind of the thing about the who is they were balls out all the time. They, yes. they were always given, they were always going hundred miles an hour. So it was, uh, they're just a different thing than the Stones. Stones were much yeah. more groovy than the Who. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. You're right. And I, and, and I, I totally agree that I don't think, in either case, they thought much about it. But you know, for me, who's next is you know, whenever you get into the what's your favorite record of all time, uh, most Who fans would say Quadrophenia. For me, who's next is just got the perfect opener, the perfect closer. But I just appreciate as a music fan that Roger did sell out in terms of his voice on that record. And it yeah. would have been easy to kind of kind of hedge a little bit just to be able to sing it later. But I also like the fact that I don't think for a long time they changed the key of it, and he still tried to hit it even on those nights when he couldn't. But I give him a lot of credit. I saw him miss it uh, live a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. But I saw him make it a couple of times too. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Who, when, I, when, you know, when I was coming up, it was you were like a, you were a Stones guy or a Who guy. 
Uh, and, and to some extent, the Beatles were in that mix too, but the Beatles somehow floated above it a little bit. Like you could like the Beatles and the Stones or the Beatles and the Who, but you couldn't like all three. And I was always, I was always a Who guy. I loved the Who. That was my favorite. And Who's Next, my favorite record of theirs as well. I, I'm with you on that. I think that's a, just a tremendous album. And, uh, yeah, and, yeah, that group just, and, and, and the idea that Townsend was kind of the glue he was the rhythm section and he let John and Roger and Keith just float all over the place. And he just was rock solid, just sitting there. And like, I just, nobody's ever done it like that. And no one will yeah. ever do it better than they did in that regard. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I remember I had the kids are all right. That, that documentary on yeah. Betamax that I got a copy. Somehow my dad found a copy and we had it at home and I watched that thing I think every day for two years or something. I watched it all the time. Just, I was fascinated with those guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. And that must be why you became a bass player, because of the ox. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know why I became a bass player. I think I think uh, the, the main reason everyone becomes a bass, well, the two reasons you become a bass player, either you realize you aren't going to be any good at guitar and it's easier to learn, which was the, my case, or you're a smart guitar player and you realize that there are fewer bass players and way too many guitar players and you just kind of end up falling into playing bass. And all the bass players I know, all of them are really good at guitar, except for me. Now I'm learning how to play guitar because I'm writing demos uh, for, for, for my band. But, um, yeah, like now that I'm kind of really in on the bass, I just, I love again, how you kind of float between two places. I mean, you're lockstep mostly with the drummer, but, uh, you know, there, obviously there's a guitar part of it. It's a bass guitar. Right. Uh, so, so I, I really like kind of being in the middle of the mix. And you can determine the, the momentum of the band. Does the band feel like it's on top of everything or does the band feel like it's laying back behind everything? That really rests with the bass. The drums to a certain extent, but it's how you guys lock together that makes that, makes that feeling, you know? For sure, yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, I always listen for, I'm a production guy, so I'm always listening to that, that mix. And I think it's tricky to get it right, to get, you know, the bass to sound full in a studio mix without overwhelming yeah. Um, but, but if, if they're doing stuff in there, I want to hear, I want to hear all the notes and, uh, that's where like, I'm a huge replacements fan and, you know, Tim is such a great record, but like I have a 19 year old son who's just kind of going through all the great records that I, that we listen to. And, you know, it's hard to listen to that record from 1984, 85, Tommy or Deli produced it and production wise, it stinks. But this, but you just have to tell people who hear it for the first time, like you just got to get past this and realize the songs are great. But that's hard, and that's why if the production is great, and that's why the who, that's why who's next to me is the best record ever because you could literally put on headphones and have somebody listen to that record, any song on that record, and not tell them when it came out. And if you said literally this came out three years ago, they'd be like, oh yeah, I'd buy yeah, it. Yeah, you're right? not wrong. It doesn't sound dated in any way. No, I think that's I think that's absolutely right. And the other thing, I mean, we're, I, this has turned into like a who love fest, but I don't <laughs> mind that. We actually no. have one. We have somebody in the in the chat room saying or Led Zeppelin. Zeppelin is amazing. Don't get us wrong, but different and different in their impact than the Who and the Stones. I think. Um, and and plus, uh, I mean, Zeppelin and the Stones were very much blues based bands yes. and borrowed very heavily from that tradition. The Who was very unique in their styling. Like they, they had nobody sounds like the Who except the Who, right? You know, and some There's of that is no question. Yeah, some of that's Moon, some of that's Daltrey, certainly, and down. They all have their own thing. You know, it's a unique gathering of individuals. And yeah, yep. Even after you know, there's a lot of bands out there in that era, especially in like the early '70s. A lot of bands sound like the Stones, a ton. You know, <laughs> there aren't that many that sound like the who. So, you know, I think. So that's a great question. If you had to come up with the band that sounds the most like the who, who would it be? And I cannot, I can't think of, of who that is. <laughs> yeah. I, I can't either. Really. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll throw that out. We'll throw that out to the comment, uh, the comment room there. It. Who can, who can say, uh, who can say out there? 
So we are going to have to talk some sports too. And we're going to get into Sonic 45 yeah. right after that. But uh, so you made a big uh, move, huh? Oh, Foo Fighters. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. yeah, there's some Foo Fighters I hear. Yeah. 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 yeah I could see but that. they're unique too. They, they kind of float around a little bit. You know? Definitely. So yeah, uh, where do I start? I'll, I'll try to give you the Cliff's Notes version of it. Uh, I definitely think the pandemic uh, put us all in a reflective mood. Uh, there's been a lot of isolation and uh, I've spent a lot of time, what I try to do every day, whether in a pandemic or not, but especially in the winter in Chicago is I, I run outside. I have a, about a six and a half mile uh, path that I do. And generally I don't run into any people. So I've been able to do it during the pandemic. And that's like my hour, hour and a half where, you know, I can just kind of empty my mind. And so as I was doing that, you know, I kind of reverted a little bit back to when I was 12, 13, 14, and uh, listened to a lot of old baseball games. And that, that radio love that I had when I was a kid listening to Ernie Harwell, who was the longtime Hall of Fame radio announcer for the Tigers. It just, it just really resonated with me. And I turned 50 next week. Uh, and Welcome I, you know, club. I don't know the, the, yes, I don't know the ages of all the people here uh, uh, who are watching and, and listening, but when you do get to middle age, uh, and I did get my AARP uh, bit in the mail the other day, so I'm, I'm official now. Uh, I think you tend to look at your life and in my case, my career, from a bit of a, a different lens, more of the 30,000 foot view. And after 16 amazing years with the Cubs and a World Series ring, uh, I was happy. I was feeling really good about everything, but I thought, you know, I still wanna do that thing that I, that I dreamed about doing when I was a kid. And I, I saw this opening in Chicago uh, that would, if it worked out, would allow me and my family to stay here in the same house and maintain all the friends I've had and uh, just maybe move my work address nine miles to the south. And it, 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 it worked out. I mean, there are a lot of details in terms of how we got there. But uh, at the end of the day, Chris, you know, we only have one big shot uh, at this thing. And I really want to remain intellectually curious. I want to be intellectually uncomfortable. I want to challenge myself to be really good at a different skill that's somewhat similar to what I've been doing, but just a little bit different. Uh, it's one reason why I started this band about five years ago, and we'll get into that and writing songs. Uh, I've got a little bit of the now or never mentality, and I don't want to be 64 or 74 and look back and say, I had an opportunity to do something that made no sense to anybody else, but it made sense to me when I was this age. And I was afraid to do it because of what other people would say or whatever. And I just decided, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. And the reaction has been interesting. I've had a lot of colleagues, a lot of friends in the business who at first didn't understand why I did what I did. And when I explained it to them, they totally got it. And, uh, I, I, as I said, I, I didn't do it for anybody else. I did it selfishly for me, but I'm, I'm thankful that people do understand who know me well enough that uh, I did it for quote, the right reasons. That's awesome. I, I mean, I, uh, I admire the move and it's, and you know, it's something that it's something to, like I say, chase a dream like that. And, and I understand your, your radio love. You know, I, I get that because there is something so pure about that. Yep. It's a, it's a different, I, I still like to listen to games on the radio more than I like to watch them on TV. Like I would rather have the game on while I'm doing something because that's, I, I just remember that, you know? <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, baseball and sports and even music to a degree, um, you get the idea of reverting to being like 12, 13, 14, right? Like, um, and I know later you're going to ask me about a song to sing and I could pick Elton John since you love him, but I'm going to, pick something from that pocket of my of my life but okay. there are some objectively horrible bands and songs from that time in my life that every time i hear one of those songs it makes me happy <laughs> and that's very interesting to me that i can sit there and i'm you know i don't need to name a band or names but like you know the early mtv era like 
yeah, there were some songs that probably should never be played again, but because they were in heavy rotation and I was just watching it all the time, like when I hear it, I go, oh yeah, that just yeah. puts me in my happy place. And you can't describe it. It just, it just, it just hits us all in that spot. Uh, I've had an argument with Matt Spiegel, our good friend about uniforms and I'm, I'm very opinionated on uniforms I like. And when I kind of go through, this is what I like and this is what I don't like, Matt tweeted at me once he goes essentially you like every uniform from when you were 12 and i'm like yeah pretty much that's it yeah all right give me for instance give me a for instance uh for instance oh my gosh i don't even know where to start um just like the nba uniforms you know just give me a home and a road you know white at home dark on the road don't be messing around with all these third jerseys i like simpler is better you know, I like the Celtics home white with the green, no other color. Um, you know, it just, it goes back to my early eighties thing. Like so the Dallas the- Cowboys uniforms. I don't like the Cowboys, but when I see that uniform, there's something very classic and, and, and really cool about it. So you're the, you're the Tampa Bay dream sickle uniform, not the current. Yeah. Red. Yeah. Actually I am too. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's-, <laughs> that's because of our age. That's right. the only reason. Or the Houston Astros <laughs> rainbow Jersey. That's, I love that. That's classic. It's amazing. Uh, the the uh, George Brett light blue Bo Jackson Royals road uniforms. Yeah, Those yeah, are the greatest yeah. road uniforms in sports history. I don't know why they won't wear them. No doubt. No doubt. All right, we're going to feel like field a couple from the from the uh, from the peanut gallery here. Let's see here. I saw a couple. Here we go. Does Len have any thoughts on Theo Epstein joining the MLB office? I uh, saw that news today, texted with Theo a little bit. Uh, I'm really excited about it. I uh, told him congratulations and in all caps, fix the game. Uh, <laughs> when somebody like me says that or tweets that, uh, invariably the reaction is, why do you hate baseball? I love baseball. Um, in 2016, when the Cubs won the World Series, including spring training, I think I called 217 baseball games. So I'm, I'm invested. I have skin in the game. I'm there every day. I watch every inning. I watch every pitch. So I feel like my opinion, um, it might not have to carry weight, but I have an opinion. And sure. the game has slowed down to a degree that there needs to be something done. Uh, people don't have five hours to invest every single day to watch baseball. There's too much uh, too many foul balls, too many strikeouts, too many walks, too many home runs. We need more action. We need more balls in play. And I think Theo understands that winning winning baseball the last 20 years made the game aesthetically worse. And I think he's going to try to do what he can to just make it, again, more like the game that we grew up watching where a two-to-one ball game should take about two hours and 25 minutes and should move along instead of a lot of standing around. Yeah, I, that is true. Do you watch uh, Brock Meyer by any chance? I have watched it. Yes, I, I haven't watched it religiously, but I've I've seen several episodes. It's well, great. Season, season three, he becomes the commissioner of baseball to fix baseball. It's worth watching. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'll check it out. <laughs> All right, what else do we have? Well, aside from the blatant self-interest here, what can you tell us about Jerry Reinsdorf that few people know? You know, that's a great question. Uh, Tom, thank you. Uh, I, uh, I'm i getting to know Mr. Reinsdorf. He called me after this all went down. Uh, we had a great conversation. Uh, you know, people know about his loyalty, but I, I will tell you, kind of integrating myself into the White Sox uh, culture, so to speak, over the last two or three weeks, uh, the uh, amount of adoration and adulation and total respect everybody internally has Uh, for Jerry Reinsdorf is real. Uh, The amount of excitement they have for this White Sox team and just how big a fan he is of the game of baseball is very real. Um, So I would just say that uh, I think his generosity is is pretty impressive. Um, To my knowledge, uh, I don't think he cut pay uh, during the pandemic. I think there were some baseball moves that they made because of the, the lack of revenue. But you know, everybody in the front office, he, he really looks out uh, for everybody and not just the players and the managers and broadcasters. He, he looks out for everybody in the organization. So 
Um, I'm getting to know him, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hearing all the, the stories of uh, the Bulls and the White Sox from decades past. Um, and that's that's about it. Very nice. Very nice. I'm going to ask you one. And this is not okay. baseball. I'm going to I'm going to jump to the NBA. What do you think about yeah. James? What do you think about this James Harden trade? <laughs> so did, did they trade like seven draft picks to get him? Eight. Something? Eight. Eight. Oof. Eight first round picks plus Victor Oladipo and Dante Exum, and another guy. I mean, I, I don't know. Usually the the team trading the superstar loses the trade. I don't think they lost this trade. Yeah, and I would say. Um, this is literally, Chris, one of those deals where if they win the NBA championship, it was worth it. And if they don't, it was bad. Yeah. yeah. You know, I think I think that's the answer. Um, Cubs fans who would criticize Theo for trading Glaber Torres to get a role as Chapman, to me, the answer is, what's the point of all of this? To me, the point is to win a World Series and the Cubs borrowed a role as Chapman for three months, and they won the World Series. So that ends the conversation. If the Cubs lost Game 6 or Game 7, and they didn't win the World Series, then I think the criticism can be on the table. Uh, I was with the Florida Marlins in 2003. They traded Adrian Gonzalez, who later went on to a near Hall of Fame career, maybe a little short of that. Uh, but they got Ugeth Urbina to help them close games, and they won the World Series. So to me, it's right. a good trade. So I would say... Uh, you got to win the whole thing if you're going to make a deal like that. And I think that's that's uh, that's a phenomenon of sports in general, especially in a town that really loves its teams like Chicago. Um, and obviously there are many, many cities like that, but you start to love your guys so much. Like, you know, nobody's more popular than the backup quarterback. Uh, right. But but at some point, the team hopefully gets to a tipping point where if we just make a couple of moves, we can get it all. And it's that's the hardest time because at that point the team's good enough that everybody loves everybody on the team. <laughs> yes. So well, here, here's the make. secret. Here's the secret. Yeah. And this comes from my time with Theo. When you make moves like this, it's when you're really good, and that move just takes you from good to great. When you're not sure how good you are, those are the moves you make that can generally come back to bite you because now you're chasing. And you're trying to like plug too many holes and too many leaks. Mm -hmm. But I think the theory generally is uh, the, the Chapman deals and the, the Harden deals and the things like that. When you make those moves, when you already think my team is probably good enough to kind of get to the NBA finals or get to the World Series or get to the Stanley Cup final. But this guy is going to make us win that last game of the season. And that's, I think, the smartest way to do it because that that creates a good process where you tell your, your team, give me a reason to add. <laughs> and, and that means win. don't start losing and go through a 10 game losing streak and then ask me to save you. That's generally how it doesn't work out. Right. Right. Eh, good point. All right. We're going to move on to Sonic 45. What, what uh, inspired Sonic 45? Well, I got, I got three different questions. We'll start there. Yeah. All right. Well, the, the, the original name of the band was The 45. Mm -hmm. It was uh, around December of 16. No, December of 15, because in January of 16, I turned 45. So I thought, OK, uh, I've been in a couple bands. Uh, I've collaborated with people. Uh, I've done Hot Stove Cool Music. I've jumped on stage with Tributo. It's been amazing. I want to kind of see if I can craft something that's kind of my own, that's worth anything. And if it's any good, great. If I just write some demos and send it to a few friends and that's the end of it, fine. But I, I put some parameters on it. And uh, the first band that I was in back in the nineties the in Milwaukee, like we kind of just did it without talking through what is it? What are we trying to sound like? And it was fun, but it, it didn't it didn't all fit. And so I thought if I put some parameters on what, what's the genre, what do I want to what am I trying to accomplish here? Um, that would help. And it's the best thing I've ever done. And I'm not giving anybody any advice. I'm just telling you for this project, it worked. So I said, what really grabs me in terms of uh, thematically where I am in my life and the idea of kind of getting older but still feeling young 
um, was the post-punk new wave kind of psych furs, Echo and the Bunnymen, the church, you know, I love the church. Um, it gives you room to kind of go to some dark places, uh, the cure, but you know, it's like, it makes you cry and it makes you dance. Right. So I just thought, Write some stuff with some cool drum machines that just kind of have some groove, maybe some disco beats, and come up with some riffs and some and some some arrangements that kind of get you in that place. So I wrote several songs, and then I lyrically tried to kind of match what I had written musically. Uh, Sisters of Mercy were another band that I kind of thought of. I mean. They're like if you took the cure and only played cure music at a funeral, right? That's what, how I would describe <laughs> Sisters of Mercy. All right, eight people have died and Robert Smith is too sad to play. So let's get the Sisters of Mercy. Now, I don't think, I don't want to scare people who don't know anything about Sonic 45 because it didn't end up being that dark, but I think I had to push myself into that place but still keep it somewhat melodic. So I, I ended up writing like 25, 30 songs over the course of like th three years. And I did the vocals, I played the guitar. I mean, everything that I did on a demo and I can send you some after we're done uh, was all me, but I'm not a singer, I'm a bass player. So when I finally kind of got everything where I felt like I had 10 to 15 good songs, I thought, okay, this is a band. Uh, who's gonna be in the band? Who do I want in the band? Um, Doug Julen, uh, who you know, who's one of our favorites, Hoy Dog Pondering, Sunshine Boys. I will take a small amount of credit for Sunshine Boys because when I told him I was writing uh, some songs, he said, you know what? I've got a bunch of old stuff. I'm gonna do the same thing. Uh, so I said, would you wanna be in this band? And I sent him all these demos. He said, I'm in, I'm in. So Doug's the guitar player. Uh, Gerald Dowd, I asked, I said, I want you to be the drummer. I'm totally in, I sent him the songs. The key was to find the right singer. And it was a little risky and you know, I don't think I'm, I'm breaking any confidence here. And I think you'll have some thoughts too, because you know Matt Spiegel uh, probably better than I do. You've been uh, with Matt and around Matt uh, as much as I have. But I pitched it to Matt that I did not want Tributosaurus Matt. I did not want to say, you have to be the Ian McCullough in this band, or you have to be the, I said, I want, if you like the songs, I want Matt Spiegel to be in this band because we're the same age. Thematically, you get what I'm trying to say here, but I want to hear you with restraint. I want to hear your soul. And it's, it's been a really interesting process. So he said, I'm all in. And it, it took him a while to kind of, break through that shell because as you know in tributo you know you're channeling bruce springsteen you're channeling right. tom petty you're channeling lindsey buckingham and i wanted him to do something that he wasn't doing uh in tributo and god love him he got there and there's some stuff on this record that you know it's matt but they're going to be people who know and love tributosaurus where if you don't tell them it's matt they're not even going to recognize that it's him and so that's been a really heartening uh, part of this whole process is getting Matt to do something completely different and to make choices that aren't based on a song that actually exists. Right. It's a song that he's helping create. But the key person of all of this is Liam Davis. Uh, Liam is a, a, a Grammy winning producer, an amazing musician. Uh, he's been in Frisbee. He's played with Justin Roberts. So he is the producer. He's also playing guitar in the band and doing some backing vocals. But um, I told him all the bands I love and what I want this to sound like. And he has produced a great record that hopefully will come out in about two months. Yeah, and Liam's a great guy. Easy to work with, a lot of fun. He's done a ton of tribute to Soros gigs. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny. It's all those, all those, uh, all those guys, you know. I think Liam's the only one who's been on the stream yet. And I'll have to correct that soon. Got to get him on, yeah. <laughs> So what do you think of my thought about Matt? Like, if I asked you to be in my band, but I said, I want Chris. Now, you, you, were, you were doing Chris tonight. Like, you were not sure, like, trying sure. to be Bob Marley. But you understand the difference. And it's it sounds easy, but it's, it's, it's not, right? Like, original music versus doing all the things that you guys do so well in Tributo. It's, it's, a, it's a different place you have to go in your, in your head, in your heart, right? Definitely. And it... And it 
it, it's a little daunting sometimes because uh, if you have no boundaries and you can do, sometimes you get paralyzed by choice. You know, it's kind of like, yes, I can do anything with this song. Well, maybe it'd be cool this way. Maybe it'd be cool this way. Sometimes it's hard to light on something that you really, really like um, or that you're willing to just say, I like this idea enough that this is the one I'm going to develop, <laughs> you know? Right. Right. That's where the parameters and the boundaries in this band were great because none of the guys as all are way more experienced than I am musically. None of them had ever been in a band like this. So for example, we have a song called I've got no alibi and dog did a riff kind of an intro in the intro that the first time he played it, I was like, Oh my God, this is amazing. And everybody loved it. And then like two days later we're listening and I'm like, it sounds like Steely Dan. And we all agreed like, as great as that riff is, that doesn't fit this genre. Mm-hmm. And he agreed. And you and and to get really good musicians to agree that his killer riff didn't quite fit, um, and have them buy into the process of no, this is this is post punk. This is you know think more Will Sargent than than this. And again, it's 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 not being those people. And you're going to hear some who stuff that 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 pops in and out of these records. And you're going to hear REM and all that stuff, but to put a parameter on Matt that, okay, here, here's the song where you can be Matt, where you can just, I want you to balls to the wall, you can let it fly. But this song here, like you're basically whispering. And that's not live Matt right. ever. Right. Right. He commands the room. And I said, you're going to command the room by just bringing them in as close as possible. And that was a process for him. But I think giving him very specific instructions on this is what this song should sound like was really helpful to him. I, and I, are you are you talking about pills by any chance, or are you? Uh, not a, no, not specifically. Because I remember when he when you guys were recording that, I Matt and I were talking a little bit, and he said, you know, it's just not, it's so different from what I'm used to. But I can tell that it's in there somewhere. And he was, he was looking for it at that point. And yeah. I mean, I've heard, I've listened to that song a lot. I, I really like that tune, by the way. Thank you. Um, and I think his performance on it is exceptional. Uh, but it's very, it, it's different. You know, it's, it's not something I would necessarily have expected. Yeah. Um, thank you for mentioning that song. So that was the most personal song I'd written. Um, I had been upfront about some anxiety issues and, you know, I take antidepressants and, you know, the song is, I wouldn't say it's ambiguous. Um, you know, I guess my one concern was, you know, in the, in the, the chorus goes, you'll be fine if you take your pills. And I think, um, some could take it as, as, as not sarcastic, but it could, it, it could lead you down a lot of roads, the idea of sure. pills. Right. Um, but that was the scariest song to write because that was very personal for me to do. And, I leaned into the idea of this is going to be the first one. And interestingly enough, it's the one all the guys in the band loved the most for that reason, that it was like, this is Len Casper who does the baseball stuff, writing about this heavy topic. And like, that's why I picked the genre I picked because if you do a power pop thing, or if you do a straight ahead rock thing, like a song like that, you got to be really careful because some people could take it the wrong way. But I think musically, if you listen to that song, lyrically, it works. But lyrically, that song would not work if the music weren't quite in that idiom. Right, right. Yeah, I yeah. think that's I think that's very accurate. Um, and you say, hey, this band is serious as a heart attack, Chris, and I make no bones about it. And if anybody out there rolls their eyes at it, I'm fine with it. But I'm telling you that we all did this as earnestly uh, and as truthfully as we could, and if people like it, uh, I love that they like it, but that the, the, the bottom line is it's something I did. I feel a sense of accomplishment and they like it. And that matters to me more than anything. And that's the best. And that has always been the best stuff. You can't make great music for someone else. You make it for yourself. And, right. and if everybody likes it, great. And if they don't get it, Screw them. <laughs> right. Right. I'm not doing this for any other reason than just to say I did it and that could I write some good songs? And, you know, Liam and I, and if you do have him on, we, we've joked about my musical naivete mm-hmm. and how helpful that has been in this band because 
seasoned musicians come in with some preconceived ideas and kind of the I got this thing and you know you give them the bones of a song and you know I say you guys know how to do this better than I do just have have at it and then they they add all this stuff and then a month later Liam comes back and he goes you know what on this song you had it right in the first place like you're doing this punk rock just like caveman thing and he's like that's the way it should sound. <laughs> and that was instructive for, for Dog and for Liam, who, you know, they just want to, their natural inclination is just to show their chops. And it's sure. not a showy, it's not a showy thing. It's just, you utilize your experience. And I think I can relate it to broadcasting even, that the more experience you get doing what I do, the simpler and the easier it gets and you don't overthink it. And when you're a young broadcaster, you try to use big flowery words. And look, Jim Nance, Joe Buck, Dick Enberg, the late Dick Enberg, all of the greats. The one thing they all share in common is the way they deliver their call is very simply, uh, it's understandable to everybody. And I think ultimately that's what this band is. It's not supposed to be overly complicated. Nothing wrong with that. It's worked for uh, it's worked for a lot of great bands. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I'm very uh, excited for the record. You say a couple of months on that, you think? Yeah, I think our hope is by uh, March or April at the latest. Uh, we are going to do some vinyl. Uh, Cheap yeah. Kiss Records, which has put out the Sunshine Boys records, um, will uh, put this out. I may have. You know what? I wish I had it on my phone. I could show you the cover, but I don't know if I do. So can they get it from your, uh, from the Sonic 45 website? Will it be up there? Yeah. Sonic 45.com is where to, to go for all the updates and information. I think it might be right there. And, uh, there it is. I encourage everybody to get up there, keep abreast of the uh, music and be ready for it. And Len, I want you to hold a vinyl copy for me. (laughs) Oh, it's all yours. I want one for sure. All yours. (laughs) And, and I, we changed the name to Sonic 45 because there was another band called the 45 in, from St. Louis. Um, they had not registered the the name. We could have fought them. In the end, I said, you know, we, I said, you know what? I don't want to. I don't want to bother with that. Um, Sonic was a word that resonated with me because production wise, uh, and I think you hear it on pills. Like I want big, bold, and so the the word Sonic. And I thought we can keep the 40. So my wife said, how about Sonic 45? And so that that's that's why we called it that. I like the name a lot. I think it I think it's uh, it's got a little uh, zing to it. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you think that. Hey, by the way, I want to give a shout out to Katrina, uh, who has been maybe uh, the, our biggest supporter, and uh, she's heard the two singles and she's heard most of the songs we've played live. But I just want to say thank you, Katrina, for all your support, and I can't wait. To be back at Hey Nani or Martyrs and playing live music again. And I can't wait to be back at Martyrs or wherever you guys are. I want I want Tributo to do every band that we all love like in one night. Can you guys just seriously like start at noon and play till like two in the morning? That's a long night. <laughs> <laughs> so what? So you've been on you've done you did REM with us? You did replacements yep. with us? Uh, I think I might've done a replacement song. Yeah. Then Petty did it. And Petty. Petty, That's right. I knew there was one. I forgot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's always fun to have you up there. So we'll, uh, we'll have to do that. again. I love it. Yeah. I love it. All right. You guys are really good by the way. You know, that's the other thing that you need to know is that when you have someone who's not nearly as good as everybody else, the fact that you guys are so good makes me better. And, uh, it really elevates and keeps me, (laughs) keeps me locked in. Um, it's a great thing about a band. It re- a really good band elevates every boat in the water. It really does. Yeah, I think I think that's true. I think that's true. And certainly, as a bass player, having Danley Alley back in you, Oof. it can that can only help you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> he's a he's a phenom. All right. Well, I uh, I really appreciate this. This was a lot of fun, man. It's good to talk to you. Same here. Um, and uh, yeah, I can't wait for Cubs Sox. I hope uh, there are a lot of people in the ballpark. It'll be uh, pretty amazing. And, and my my great friend, John Shambi, who uh, took my old job last week, you're going to love him. He's awesome. On the air, off the air, great guy. I hope you get to meet him soon. And 
Will you play something from the from like between 1982 and 1986, and you can play anything you want, but just something that might have been popular and might have been on MTV that young Len Casper would have would have liked. <laughs> I'm gonna let you, you pick the band, do whatever you want, but just a young from Len from Casper era. tune. All right, let me think about yeah. the 82 to 86. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. I'm the worst with that too. I cannot. I can never well, remember. You could do. You could do. You could do the Elton John era, you know, the guess what's up, that's why they call it the blues. I mean, that was the MTV era. I, I, I would I would accept that. Okay. Okay. Maybe I'll do something like I'm, that. I am going to give still you. standing, you know. Oh, oh, God. I can't play that song. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't. My, I, I just can't out of professional courtesy because I can't do it without laughing at it. <laughs> <laughs> but I will do be, while I'm thinking about it. I'll give you something. Uh, I'll give you something from Who's Next. I'll do. I'll do. Uh, I'll, yes. I'll do. Uh, getting in tune. So oh, love it. Yeah. <laughs> All that, right. But you know what? That works. You don't have to do any any crap from the eighties. Well, I like the eighties. I mean, hey, eighty two and eighty six. That's a sweet spot for me. That's high school and my freshman year of college. That's beautiful. Okay. All right. So everybody, go to sonic forty five dot com. Listen to ESPN one thousand. And uh, Len, you're uh, you're awesome. Thank you for coming on, man. Hey, I- uh, re- really appreciate you having me on, Chris. Good to see a friendly face uh, during this uh, crazy time. And uh, love you. We'll see you soon, man. You got it, buddy. Talk to you soon. Okay. How about that? I feel so privileged. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was awesome. How about that? My gosh, Len Casper, everybody. You know. That's uh, an interesting thing. It's the first time I've had a guest on that hasn't performed a song. Uh, and I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did because I really enjoyed that interview. Um, and it's all in preparation for me getting a big late night show and being able to have all kinds of people on. <laughs> Hold on here. I'm just... Uh, I'm trying to pull your comments over. There we go. I'm trying to pull your comments over so that I can see what you're saying. Ah, there we go. There we go. All right. So what did I tell him I was going to do? Oh, I told him I was going to do uh, um, getting in tune, right? All right. I can do that one. I do. Uh, I do love that song. And, uh, you know, I'm with him. I think the who, the who sets the bar for many uh, of bands of those are and beyond. All right. I'm going to have a little bit of water because, you know, Roger Daltrey. Mm. Hildy, I saw that and I will do that even though I rarely do that song. I can do that for you. All right, here we go. Um, One more time. If you do feel like sending a tip, you can send it right there and uh, it will be much appreciated. But in the meantime, here's a little who for you and for Len Casper. I'm singing this note cause it fits in well with the chords I'm playing I can't pretend there's any meaning hidden in the things I'm saying But I'm in tune, right in tune I'm in tune, and I'm gonna tune right in on you say do you come here often when I look in your eyes and see the harmonies and the heartache soften cuz I'm in tune right in tune I'm in tune and I'm gonna tune right in on you right my head there's nothing more needs to be said I'm banging on my old piano I'm getting it to, to the straight and narrow It fits in well with the way I'm feeling 
There's a symphony that I hear in your heart Sets my head a-reeling But I'm in tune Right in tune I'm in tune And I'm gonna tune Right in tune Nothing more needs to be said I'm just playing on my own piano I'm getting it to do this great and narrow I'm getting it to do this great and narrow A little who there for Len Casper and for all of you. So I have uh, another thing I'm going to do real quick. I'm going to do another song. And then I have a premiere, a world premiere of the Yellowhammers brand new song and video called President's Day. And they wanted to get it to me. I'm actually going to have the Yellowhammers on in a couple of weeks. You may remember them from uh, the Christmas special, their amazing Christmas song and video. And they have a, a follow-up that they asked me to premiere here. They're going to be on uh, in February sometime. I think maybe right after the actual President's Day. And speaking of coming up, next week on the program, we have Mr. Robin Benjamin or Benjamin, I suppose. Now, if you know Jenny Benneman, and she's been on the show, uh, uh, Robin is her husband and a uh, an amazing songwriter in his own right. And uh, I think his music is so entertaining and quirky and funny, but uh, complex and interesting. Um, you got to kind of hear it. Uh, and I hope you will. So next week, please come and see Robin because, man, he's got some great stuff. It's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, let's see, what am I going to do? I was thinking about playing some guitar tonight, but man, time flies when you're having fun. But you know what I am going to do? I'm going to do, um, how about, I'm trying to think of what I have from 82 to 86. I don't know what year some of this stuff is from. That's the problem is I just don't know. I think I'm not going to worry about that right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have an 82 to 86 song firmly in there that I will play next week <laughs> for Len. So Len, tune in next week for your song. Um, oh, you know what, though? Actually, I take that back. I have a song that I will do. This is a Joe Jackson tune. And this is from, I believe, hmm, I suppose I should look it up. huh? Let's see. Joe Jackson. Ah, uh, what a guy. And it's not Get What You Want, though I do love that song. One of the uh, one of the first uh, songs I played with my college band, Modern Humans. All right, that is 1991. A little late. I'm doing it anyway. This is from uh, the album Laughter and Lust, and, uh, and I love it, so I'm going to do it. All right. I haven't played this in a while, so let's hope it goes great. I don't love you, but I'm lost. Thinking of you And the ghosts of so many special moments That pass so quickly at the time 
And now they come and track me down And echo round and round and round And time goes slowly Or disappears completely And I feel like I fade away Like drowning I don't need you But it's so hard To be without you Though you're not far away I censor my emotions And tell myself to bide my time But every time you come around they batter my defenses down But so, so gently Like some sweet hypnosis And the world just slips away I'm drowning Stuck, my heart is pounding. I'm sinking down into a pool of passion. There's laughter as I drown, like so many lost before me. Damned by lust and gone to hell. And then I look into your eyes And something melts A shake inside And cool water It washes me all over It washes me away Still I'm drowning Joe Jackson. He could do some tunes, huh? Not bad. Drowning. All right. As I promised you, a world premiere right here on this very stage. I don't know. Uh, and this will be, oh, that's interesting. I have my, uh, my phone obviously reset while we were doing that. So you didn't get my keyboard. Eh, that's all right. So anyway. Oh, thank you, Alicia. Happy 2021 to you as well. Uh, don't worry, I'm not forgetting you, Hildy. I'm not forgetting you, but I'm going to do this video first. And when we get back, I will, uh, I'll do something for Hildy.
the Yellow Hammers. Wow. <laughs> that was outstanding. How about that, huh? So they wanted to make sure that uh, I had that on the show this week uh, because they wanted it on before the inauguration. Uh, and then, uh, as I said, we're going to have them on as a group, uh, and that'll be, um, I think, the 18th of January. So more reasons to show up. And I will admit that I did play a little bit on that song because I do enjoy it. Uh, so uh, our good friend Hildy Lieberman's on here. And Hildy, uh, her husband, Lebo, also uh, a fan and a good friend, passed away just recently. And, um, and uh, that's tragic. And we will miss him. And uh, she has requested that I do this song because I know he loved it. And uh, so that's what I'm going to do. And uh, I don't honestly think I've ever done this song solo, but I'm going to do it. Hey, where do we go? Days when the rains came Down in the hollow We're playing a new game a Laughing and a running, hey, hey Skipping and a jumping in the misty morning fog weather. Ah, oh, my heart's a thumping in you, my brown eyed girl. You, my brown eyed girl. Whatever happened Tuesday and so slow. Going down the old mine with a transistor radio. Standing in the sunlight laughing, hop behind a rainbow's wall. Slipping and sliding all along the waterfall with you. My brown eyed girl. You, my brown eyed girl. Do you remember when oh, we used to sing sha la 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 da da just like that sha la 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 da da la da da I don't know how to do that <laughs> So hard to find my way Now that I'm all on my own So you just the other day My, how you have grown Cast my memory back then, Lord Sometimes I'm overcoming and about Making love in the green, green grass Behind the stadium with you my brown eyed girl, you my brown eyed girl. Everybody. And we used to sing, sha la 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 di da, laying in the green grass, sha la 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 di da. La 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 All right, a little Van Morrison. I'm going to do one more, and then I'm going to call it quits for the night. And what am I going to do? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a, uh, I'm going to do a sad song because uh, I'm sad about Lebo. So I'm going to do that. But next week, we'll be back with lots of fun. Next week, Robin Bienemann will be here, and uh, you don't want to miss it. I guarantee you it will be an education in musicality. Hmm. 
And also, last time, if you want to get a hold of me, you can do it right there. Any of those places. If you need to, I don't know, you want to make a request, you want to hire me to do something, you want to, I don't know, make a comment, make a suggestion, whatever. I would be happy to hear from you in any of those places. So, and of course, you can send a tip. They'll be in the description. They'll be in the final credits. So, let's do... Ha! Hey, I got my reverb back. Okay, let's do... Oh, I should tune. See, last week, I played uh, the guitar, and I could not keep it in tune because I realized I hadn't changed my strings in forever, and they were pretty grimy. And I remembered that this afternoon at about 3 o'clock. So I changed the strings uh, just a short time ago. Not the best idea. But, uh, you know, it, did so it does sound better, and it certainly plays better. So, <laughs> here we go. Usually in the morning, I'm filled with sweet belonging, and everything is beautiful to see. Even when it's raining, the sound of heaven singing is simply joyful music to me. Sometimes I feel like a sad song, like I'm all alone without you. So many different places A million smiling faces And life is so incredible to me Especially to be near you And how it is to touch you Oh, paradise was made for you and me Sometimes I feel like a sad song Like I'm all alone without you I know that life goes on just perfectly Everything is just the way that it should be Still there are times when my heart feels like breaking And anywhere is where I'd rather be Oh, and in the night time I know that it's the right time To hold you close and say I love you so have someone to share with and someone I can care with and that is why I wanted you to know sometimes I feel like a sad song like I'm all alone without you Sometimes I feel like a sad song Like I'm all alone Without you Without you Ooh. God rest, Lebo. Wonderful to see you all. I will see you all next week.